Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Rick Kearns, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, a group of poets laureate that are part of this anthology that's called Undocumented. And it's poet la poets laureate writing about social justice. And um, what I did is I got a hold of some of the poets laureate in our region uh, to come forward and, and read from the anthology as well as a few other pieces. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the introductions. We'll start with our first poet and then we'll be taking turns. After the reading, we're gonna have a book signing. So hopefully if folks uh, would like to purchase a copy, uh, please do and we can, we can sign them, uh, uh, mostly for free, okay? And, uh, and so, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first reader. We have, there's five of us, and our first uh, poet, poet laureate is Heather Thomas. She's the author of Vortex Street from Future Cycle Press, and three other full-length poetry collections, Blue Ruby, Resurrection Papers, and Practicing Amnesia. Her honors include a Rita Dove Poetry Prize, a Virginia Center for the Creative Arts Residency, and a term as Burke's Poet Laureate. Uh, she has work in Undocumented, okay? Great Lakes Poets Laureate on Social Justice, which came out, from, came out this year from uh, Michigan, Uni Michigan State University Press. She has work forthcoming in the Stillwater Review, the Shining Rock Poetry Anthology, and her poems have been translated into seven languages, including Arabic, Italian, and Swedish, with Spanish translations of Vortex Street coming for this year's Latin American Poetry Festival in Buenos Aires. All right. And she's uh, a great poet and a really nice person, so please welcome my friend Heather. Good evening, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here to celebrate um, the book Undocumented and to be part of it and to see you all here tonight uh, coming out to support the book. I am gonna start with uh, a poem from my childhood. Uh, which references the first time as a little girl of about nine that I was aware of racism in our country. I grew up in a very white family, white culture, white town. And, um, and this poem includes my some of my recollections of the time when my mother remarried and I uh, was adopted by a stepfather and had a whole new family at the age of about 10 and uh, also includes uh, uh, my growing awareness of the world around me. 1961, first upside down year. Ham the chimp rockets into space. Make room for daddy. I offer my daughter bread, not a stone. Registered Chabette at Lobel's clothing store, she tries to fathom the Bay of Pigs, new math. Across the boulevard, new stepsisters. Through the wall, new brother wails as freedom riders cross state lines. The new dog sleeps in a kitchen cage. I offer my daughter bread, not a stone. Do letters add up when stories are forgetting? Two, Alabama whites ignite a bus, hold shut the doors with freedom riders trapped inside. She stands before the TV's snarling dogs, blacks attacked with fire hoses seared in brain for life. To be hatched instead of born, parthenogenesis, would that make you free? I offer my daughter bread, 
not a stone, when stories are forgetting over. The new dog sleeps in a kitchen cage. Three, our family is a little corporation, mother says. Daddy is the president. The president says we are a military industrial complex with strategic interests for preserving markets. I offer my daughter bread, not a stone. With Presbyterians, she has debts instead of trespasses. No gold leaf vines twining the lights. No backlit Jesus hovering in wind-blown robes flying toward her from the illumined window behind the cross. I wrote the next poem after the uh, school shooting at Sandy Hook in 2012. Vapor. Let's draw the place where you live. Let's draw the one at home waiting for you, the food you will eat under your desk, under the wooden library table, inside the instrument closet. Take this piece of paper, this crayon. Nurturing, healing, love, Jesse has written on the board. Promise me. Now run outside and keep your eyes shut. From here on, nothing will be like. I was just thinking. They were just singing, leaning on each other. In the time it takes to breathe 10 breaths, to what extent do we actually see or hear? What is the escape plan for children between the ages of reason and magic? Keep looking at me, because life is a vapor and days are alphabets, because the truth one is not permitted to say. Omit me, go back in, fold your hands on the table. Let's make maracas from bottles, tissue, and gourds. Now run outside and keep your eyes shut. The motion of hope is not circling alone on a field, gasping for air. Keep looking at me. Let's try harp of gold. Here is a shoebox. What else do we need? After the uh, Parkland, Florida school shooting, I wrote this poem um, called America. America. My country tis of quivering child breath held in a closet. My country tis of freeze your pounding heart in class. My country tis of nurturing, healing, promise, shot. My country tis of run outside with your hands up. My country tis of bullet, bump stock, scope, and silence. My country tis of A-R-O-K, -okay, A-R-O-K. -okay. My country tis of brainwash, won't rinse blood money. My country tis of children sacrificed, dead or alive. My country tis of brain death, soul death, ghost guest. My country tis of guns, loved more than children. I have two more poems. Um, this next one was, was published online. In, um, on a website called Poets Read the News, and it's called Go Bag. Has anybody packed their go bag in case of emergency? Yeah, me either, but I'm, I think about it a lot. Yesterday, you know, with that tornado warning. Go bag. Wandering in the dark, there's the greatest, greater darkness of the chair. Don't trip. Shadows make a sound, the sightless hear in the air's vibration. When morning comes, leaves lose their green at a pace your body remembers. Today, the azure sky shows no sign of falling. Face what you need to know. Now try to let go of the thoughts. They keep you from packing your go bag. Sometimes in the heat, you close your eyes. They flip open with every 
true lie. More than 6,000 in 649 days. Thank God the Post keeps track of that man. We are all flying at a speed beyond thinking. Where am I? Your mother asks. We are all here together without knowing. Her job is getting up each morning. She knows someone who will sleep tonight, but not how to get into bed. I used to know, she says, but not anymore. Forgetting a breath at a time, while the evening rain turns torrential, flooding the yard, and in California, thousands of houses burn. And I'll close with my poem that's in the, uh, in the book, Undocumented. But it's also in here, which I have marked, so I'll read it out of my book, Vortex Street. Atonement. Which one travels toward the stranger? Who, in night speed slits of borders, time zones, word maps crossing multilingual, what's on the tongue, risking trust without translation? Atonement in a zip of light drawn across the skies at one mint as the light shifts but does not separate one with other one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it is my ecstatic pleasure to introduce our next poet, Carla Christopher, the inimitable Carla Christopher, the award-winning and multiply published fourth poet laureate of York, Pennsylvania. She is a cultural educator and diversity trainer specializing in African American and LGBTQA issues and a dynamic international public speaker for sure. She is also a professional community organizer and a seminarian at United Lutheran Seminary at Gettysburg. Please join me with a warm welcome for Carla Christopher. Afro is a hipster halo mimicking the sun. My dashiki, another sneaky reference to the black butterfly that I have become since discarding that sticky chrysalis of a monochromatic existence. My colors run unchecked through finish lines and pearly gates. I am heaven's gold streets. I am Oya, sister and life mate of Shango. I dance with fire and I rule the winds wherever I go and wherever I please these feet tap dance to the rhythm of destiny ease on down, ease on down. Skin so rich in golden brown desert and soil fight to claim me but I am still the sun's. It is so really, really amazing to be in front of all of you. Um, I am often, more often perhaps than a performing poet, an educating poet. And so one of the first things I have to do is win over my young people to why poetry is not eye rolling and ugh, poetry again. And so I ask them how many newspapers they're reading that are thousands of years old. How many shows, how many factual recitations of war and conquering are they reading that are thousands of years old? And the answer is very few. But how many poems and plays and stories have they read that go back not just generations but across cultures and through eons? And they realize, oh, that's why this matters. 
that's why telling stories in a personal way matters. I'm like, yes, you are the reporters, you are the historians, you are the keepers of time and history through your writing. And that's why I think it's really important I mention that because this is not just regular writing in this book. This is a collection of poet laureates who focus on social justice who have gathered their poems that are specifically telling the stories of the most voiceless in our communities. They are lifting up and empowering the very ones who we need to learn from and who are least equipped to tell their story, who are the least listened to. So it is not the five of us who you are hearing and meeting on this stage. It is everyone who has ever wanted and needed to tell their story and not been able to. And that's a heavy thing to carry on our shoulders. So that first poem is actually in this book because it was written for working with uh, young African-American high school girls in uh, inner city school system who were very challenged to find ways that they were beautiful. And so that poem was an example to them, and they also wrote them with me, um, that it is a revolutionary act to claim your own beauty. This, uh, this next one is also in this book and was also inspired by working with young people. If I don't break the law, maybe they won't kill me. If I don't steal cigarettes, sell cigarettes, carry weapons, carry toy weapons, carry Halloween costume weapons, cell phones that bulge a pocket like a weapon, pill bottles that curve my hand like a hand that probably wants to or maybe at one time might have held a weapon, if I promise not to defend myself against their weapons, Maybe they won't kill me if I don't drink liquor or soda with my Skittles. If I don't eat my words before spitting back the injustice that I'm choking on because I still can't breathe, then maybe, maybe if I just don't breathe, they won't kill me. Or maybe no matter what I do, They'll come for me through the wires of my cell phone, through the vaccine-filled needle, through sentencing and prosecution, through protection from indictment, through the ghosts of Tuskegee, through the slice of a knife dividing my piece of American pie into a revisited three-fifths compromise. If you can kill me, and it only counts some of the time, does that not dehumanize me? completely? I am a black woman. And since that dug my grave the day my mother gave me life, at least let me hold that and drag it like a black person chained to the back of a rough road riding flatbed. I will riot in my mind and in my lines and in my ideas until the matrix overloads and the rioting explodes into these streets, crumpling the metal and shattering the glass of soul eye windows, double pane ceilings, until the heat from my rage incinerates the page, the screen, the stage, so that the meaning can rise like a sword-wielding phoenix from biblical ashes, we must take the tower down. Thank you. One of the things that I love to do is work collaboratively. Um, because I do so often tell stories from, um, from other people's lives. And the only way to truly tell someone's story is to listen. So uh, this next trio of poems was actually written with uh, the AARP, 
um, to help understand that just because you have crested the golden era of your years does not mean that you are not a wealth of joy and inspiration and ideas that the whole world can learn from. So there is a, a poem here that tells the story of Kisu. He's a York native, a father and a grandfather who taught himself Caribbean and African drumming through YouTube. A dancer, a ballet and modern dancer um, who does floor bar because she has mobility issues so significant she struggles to walk, but she still wanted to find a way to dance. And a former Miss Pennsylvania Senior America named Miss Nan, um, who is a teacher who does uh, manners and empowerment mentoring for young women uh, and who frequently sings in her church choir. So this is their their stories. This is why I drum. Because my hand is strong enough to make it shout and gentle enough to make it sing. I strike the drum because the rhythm of its beat speaks the language of my ancestors, songs to which my heart still knows every word. I strike the drum because the simple frame and skin has called whole tribes to war, boys to battle, and children to gather, because inside this sound, I am timeless. I strike the drum. This is why I dance. Because the drums have made us move since before time began. Because when I move, I still hear them. Feel them in my blood, my bones, my back, because I still move like the river when the memories inside my soul begin to swerve. I dance because my daughters move like I do, with long bodies and strong spirits, because it's my job to teach them to move with grace and beauty. I dance because inside the joy of being, we move together in endless circles. Always and ever, I dance. This is why I sing, because I have a voice, a story, a heart, and a purpose. I sing, because joy has forever been waiting on the other side of a rough road. I sing. Because when words have failed and explanations were not enough, there was the truth of a choir on Sunday morning, the truth of a lullaby before bed each night, the truth of a crackling car radio when we danced underneath the stars. Because music is the language we all share. Every day I sing. And this last poem that I'm going to share is uh, a collaboration with a man who is long gone. But there is uh, a movement um, working with the Martin Luther King Institute um, teaching nonviolent conflict resolution, which is work that I frequently do in our school districts. And so this is. Uh, the words of the last speech that Martin Luther King gave before he was assassinated, uh, mixed with an internal dialogue um, of what I imagine Dr. King may have been uh, wrestling with at this time. Um, because when I read the words of this speech, it read as a man who was very aware what was coming for him. This is a blues for the living, or a requiem for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. 
but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. I have died inside again and again and again. I have continued to breathe around the knife. I have wept like a trombone alone on a sweat-soaked summer evening, moaning my song over a moonlight-coated Susquehanna. I have broken my back on the long pull of a note shaped into a single sound requiem. I have surrendered who I am for who you needed me to be. Mississippi become Gethsemane. Lord, man that I am, I am here almost, if never wholly, ready. He's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, we will get to the promised land. My eyes have seen, my ears have heard the military pulse of a snare drum snapping the lazy sway of a tired soul back to attention. This is not protest. This is not argument. This is the determination of a man. We are determined to be a people, ley lines stretched beneath oceans, maps drawn in blood, We've carved a dark testament into the cornerstones of everything we built for you. The earth trembles in the places continents come together. And one day, all walls will come down. I'm not saying we are God's children and we need to live this way. I'm saying because we are God's children, we don't have to live like we're being forced to live. We don't have to live like we're being forced. We don't have to live. We don't. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I'm going to heal you, said the guitar slide to the slave, said the diddly bow to the sharecropper, said the saxophone to the slouch pant boy on the corner, unafraid, like the strike of piano keys against hard wire, in the smoke you blow skyward is the poetry of a dozen tribes of Africa. God's children will sing their way into each of their versions of heaven. The kingdom of the Lord smells like the ocean. With your eyes closed, you can always return home without getting lost. You just go back the way you came, but make them call you by your name. You are a man, dark brothers. You are a man. Now, let me say, as I move to my conclusion, that we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. We've got to see it through. And when we have our march, you need to be there. Be concerned about your brother. Either we go up together or we go down together. But we need all of you. I said, I've seen the mountain. And victory can be found on its golden wrapped peaks. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Turn us around. Turn me around. 
Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around, and gonna let nobody turn me around. We're gonna keep on walking, keep on walking, marching up to freedom land. I'm so excited. We have our next poet that is coming up to join us, and it is Sandra Fees. Now, Sandra has been a Berks County Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2018, and is the author of two chapbooks, which I think the temporary vase of hands is such a beautiful image that I actually wrote a poem inspired by it because I just was fascinated by this beautiful line, and also moving and being moved in 2017. And she is another uh, faith leader. She's a Unitarian Universalist minister um, who came all the way down to us from Reading today. And uh, you will be delighted by the universe that she will open for you in her words. So please welcome Sandra Fees. It was so great when I first met uh, Carla and we discovered we have this sisterhood as poets but also as uh, ministers. So it's kind of cool. I want to begin with a um, poem that really is a tribute to a professor of mine, Dr. Banganjala Goba, who was a great inspiration to me. He was South African and worked on the issue of apartheid. After Dr. Banganjala Goba's death, in class, he queried us, what gets you up in the morning? I craved a reply worthy of what he believed we could each be for the other, urgent as a liberated thing, such as a flight of crows or children at recess. Now at night, I startle awake Padding down the hall, white rectangles cast themselves across the rug like piano keys. My eyes seek the source and pierce layers of glass and a brittle web of magnolia branches to catch the gibbous moon adrift like a pale balloon. I want to tell him I get up for the promised light fullness of this, a life well used. That, thank you. that poem was published, thank you, in Undocumented. And um, I want to share the other two pieces of mine that were published in this anthology. Um, the other two pieces both relate to work I have done around the immigration justice issue and in particular uh, work that I got involved with with the detention center, family detention center in Berks County. Very heartbreaking work. The first poem of these two, um, I, I'm looking at this experience or trying to look at this experience through the eyes of the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. Asylum thwarted. What would Anna Akhmatova say? She who could describe the frightening years waiting in prison queues in rain gray Leningrad two years before my birth in a country I may never see. What would rise 
in her mouth, like trees grown whole overnight, planted first in her songbird breast, branches outstretching the vastness of grief, to name what must be named in any age, in any nation. How can I invoke her words to rise again in my mouth, in the shape of trees, to describe the years when something called asylum failed to take root in the pursed lips of my country, majesty of the beautiful, how can I invoke her words in the isolating years as I wait outside these detention center doors in rain gray Pennsylvania to visit Salvadoran mothers and children who appeal for a postlude to this song of Requiem? We tried to do small things for the families and for the children who really didn't get to leave that facility except on rare occasions. And at the holidays, we collected gifts that we delivered to them, or at least tried to. And this poem really tries to capture some of that experience. Keeping time at the family detention center. His face unchanging, the guard catalogs Christmas gifts as though a toy helicopter or wristwatch are contraband and returns the silver watch, its ivory face and Arabic numerals prohibited from keeping time within the faceless brick walls of family detention, where a Salvadoran boy counts days and his mother counts years. Is makeup okay, I ask? Because his mother wants to make herself over for the shimmery release that awaits her and her son who loves math and folds origami paper into orange and pink cranes to multiply the dream of flight. Yes, but no compacts with mirrors, replies the guard. My reflection hovers in the window, a veil of whiteness above the guard's shoulder. And beyond the glass, Empty playground swings dangle while afternoon light casts slivery shards to pierce the facade. Thank you. That mother and son were deported. I want to read two more pieces, and I saw that Lee Hinton checked off that he was going to be here tonight. I might have read this piece anyway, but I didn't want to read it because it's, it's from an anthology that, um, of Pennsylvania poets that Lee edited, and um, it's Bards Against Hunger, Pennsylvania. My poem is not about hunger. Uh, it really speaks to gun violence, which We've heard about tonight also from Heather. Twenty-five. First Baptist Church, Texas, Sunday, November 5th, 2017. In minutes, it's the time it takes to stitch a button back on a shirt or watch a TED Talk. It's intervals of work bracketed by short breaks and the time it takes to learn the names 
of 25 plus one, killed in church, kneeling in prayer, who can't be stitched back. 25 of anything isn't enough to save the world. So I listen, try to believe in something, spend 25 minutes reading aloud to someone, singing by a bedside, stopping what needs stopping, chanting every name I know for love until the light in the room softens. 25, more than enough for sky to turn its day blue to melon, then lavender, to look down, witness hands made for mourning. I want to close with a poem that I think of as a poem that is lyrical and a little bit mystical and mostly hopeful. But I've also come to believe that the poems we write about justice are also poems that do all those things as well. So it's a separation in my mind that may not be real in, in fact. Silver latched. Morning opens an anthology of silver latched things. Nut hatch, skittering, peeling bark, like a tiny skater etching the alphabet. Every cell of sky and lip, lake and finger repays wisdom to those who have fallen out of sorts, out of love, who have lost faith in whatever once held sway, who somehow hearkening to bird calls still rise as if by instinct lured toward windows and tree chapels, forgetting what hangs from hooks, what occupies books or idols on shelves, not stopping for binoculars, not even shoes. What can't be human made enters the heart, not words, but light. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here in Harrisburg. It's a place I lived for a number of years before I moved to Reading, and so it feels a bit like a homecoming for me. And I have the great pleasure now to introduce our next poet, Barbara Buckman Strasco, whose reputation I knew of uh, long before I had the pleasure of meeting her. Barbara is the first poet laureate of Lancaster County, she is the 2009 River of Words Teacher of the Year. Her poems have appeared in Best New Poets, Ninth Letter, and Poet Lore. Her book of poems is Graffiti in Braille, published in 2012. Her poem, Bricks and Mortar, is engraved in granite in Lancaster's main square. How cool is that? Wow, every poet wants that, Barbara. You're going to have to help us out. It's my pleasure now to introduce Barbara. Hi, it's great to be here and to be reading poems about social justice. And I want to thank Rick for pulling this together. And I'm going to start with a poem. Um, I, I was a teacher. I was a guidance counselor in the city schools of Lancaster and also a reading specialist and literacy coach. 
As a reading specialist uh, and creative writing teacher at times, uh, I was able to work with many students. This, this, is the, this is the poem that's published in the book. It's called Esperancia. At five, she was selling food in Haiti. No time for school. Too much hunger to take care of. And now what she misses about her country is the swimming. In Argentina, a year later, there was no safe passage to school for children of her color. On the way, she explained, you could be taken. She screamed at a man in the market when he did not pay. She yelled in her Creole Spanish, and the police nearly took her away to the place they take you. Now, at age seven, she tells me in her soft-spoken English the memory of her father, who was taken away and cut and when he ran up the mountain out of breath, he sent his family away to the airport, carrying nothing. She tries to read the book about seasons. English is the first language in which she has tried to decipher words, each letter a struggle, each picture new. She seems to know so little, but really knows so much. She wants to go back to Haiti, to the sun, and to the many colored fruits of her market. She dreams of swimming in three languages. Thank you. So this is another poem, um, basically, that I, I wrote as a result of listening, and Carla was talking about that, uh, listening to my students, and uh, this was teaching creative writing. Trees die standing up. Francis writes of a silent box and its broken contents. Tienes un pita que no pita. You have a horn that does not blow. Tamisha writes, men's in jail is bad and sometimes they don't get fed. Another student's poem begins, the harsh wind of loneliness pushed her down the street. We think of new ways to speak, to change our stories. She whistled like a poison princess in a glass casket. She touched the hunger of her brother and changed it into honey and bread. The mother lies in a hospital room, moonlight falling through the shades to save her. I forgot to mention, we must turn ourselves completely around three times speak in tongues so the past can leave us in haste. Los árboles mueren de pie, the trees die standing up as the rocks in the stream sink to us. She finishes her stanza with, in jail, men's in jail goes to sleep in a dark room thinking about his kids and writing with chalk. Now this, this poem is written uh, about war, and these are some of my social justice heroes. It's called Ode to the Berrigans. And if you don't know who the Berrigans are, they were priests that destroyed draft records during the Vietnam War. And this is my poem to them. I owe to you my son, whose father would have gone to war, maybe never returning. His fate was set by you that day in New Brunswick, a day spent ripping files, pouring blood. As priest, you marred records. You saved my husband, his number low, but never called. Will there be others to take your place? This generation, too stunned by the last. You saved my husband, his number low, but never called. Instead, we had a son, his eyes dark brown. Now he writes poems, one about a war he dreads, and one about a war I know he could have never understood. He is opposed to all violence and seems to have come into this world speaking in long sentences about love. Your son, 
as much as ours. Um, this, this poem addresses uh, some things about the war, but also uh, addresses a little bit the abortion issue. And so I, I see the, a social justice in that. Saddle shoes. My summer night shift job in the Nabisco cookie factory lasted a week. I didn't know the shoes I bought would make a fight with my father or that the Oxfords would outlast him. I polished them, smeared specks across the white. My friend and I took the train to New York where she could get an abortion. Five hours I waited in the park, bought acrylic, painted suns over the polish. She didn't notice the shoes, in pain in the cab, bleeding on the train. Our eyes deciphered windows of graffiti in black and white, all, it ev all of it angry and none of it against the war. At home, we walked door to door with petitions while men on the corner called us Hanoi agents. We sent signatures, as if names could stop bombs. The suns washed away, leaving golden specks mixed with brown. The night after Kent State, men in Uncle Sam suits on stilts jeered at us in front of the Hamilton Club. Wasn't it a blue flower she put in the soldier's rifle a minute before her death? I painted my shoes with day orange daylilies the same flowers blooming near my father's grave. On the dashboard of my boyfriend's VW bug, I drew green mountains on a blue lake. And this poem um, has to do with the land being destroyed via urban sprawl for the most part. And uh, so I see that as a social justice issue. Our culture is being changed. And uh, I actually read this in a meeting, a zoning kind of meeting the other night. Um, and I wrote it after the poet Je Robinson Jeffers, and there are a few uh, lines of his in the poem. And it's called Divided Highways. How beautiful it is, an unbroken field of patterns, earth and husks, with a clear view of sky. The patience of land to wait for us, to love its beauty, to turn away from thought. No intrusion, but a house or two, a barn, a silo, cows, grazing through grass on a silent afternoon. Now they speak of houses and highways. Do they care about the disruption of the land? Not at all. They treat it as a tide which will ebb but never flow. The image of beauty lives in the very grain with flour which flourishes. To stay truly human, we must unhumanize our view. In our desire to preserve the land, we must try to be as confident as the stalk which reaches for the sun. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce Rick uh, Kearns, and he was kind enough to put this whole program together, and I thank him very much. And he was Poet Laureate of Harrisburg. I'm sure everyone knows who he is. But he has published in some very great journals, which I love, uh, Massachusetts Review, Painted Bride, and Chicago Review, all, all great journals that I, I really admire, and I admire him, and we're very lucky to have him. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to read a couple pieces, my two pieces that are in the anthology. Uh, between 2006 and 2017, 
I wrote for Indian Country Today, uh, which is the largest Native American uh, news publication in, uh, in this country. And I mostly covered indigenous Latin America. Uh, and this uh, piece is based on a story that I encountered. And I'll give you a little intro to it. <clears throat> on September 26, 2014, Mexican police seized 43 students and allegedly delivered them to gang members who killed them, burned their bodies, and left some of the remains in a garbage dump. The students, many of whom were indigenous, are known as the Ayotzinapa 43. Alejandro Mora Benancio was one of the 43 and somebody that I wrote about. He was from the municipality of Tecoanapa, and so I took that word apart. In Nahuatl, which is uh, which the language of the Aztecs, Tecoani means tiger and apam means in the river. And this poem is called Tecoani and Alejandro. Tiger in the river smells charred bones in the garbage pile. Someone is lying. Tiger swims away, men with machines, bone ash floating everywhere. Garbage pile is full today. Martyr's boneyard, tiger in the river, executioner in the palace. Someone is dying. I am Alejandro. The swimming tiger is my protector now. The tiger in the river is not another trickster from the north. He knows who killed me. The tiger in the river knows about the executioner in the palace, the TV toadies, the men with masks, the men with helmets. My tiger in the river is waiting. It's lunch. And uh, this is a Harrisburg poem, actually. And I was amazed. I was, I'm always happily amazed when my stuff gets published, but this one in particular really caught me off guard that they, anyway. <clears throat> this is called The Geopolitics of Uptown Skunks. <laughs> the enemy of our food is the fly. So we kill the flies that used to fill the webs of the six spider species cohabitating with us in our vintage duplex uptown. And now the spiders need other things to eat. So they fill every empty space in and around my house in search of other sustenance. Can't walk out the back door without ducking to the right in order to avoid a mouthful of gossamer goodness. The enemies of the spreading suburbs are the trees and animals that make it impossible to lay block, to build foundations that do not include homes for skunks and a possum. So the skunks hang in my backyard and rumble with alley cats and other varmints hunting at night, shooting defensive stink clouds which rise majestically and seep through the old windows of my dear old house while I'm watching TV. The enemies of the Russians way back when were the Taliban fighters amassing in Afghanistan, so we gave them missiles and rifles and cash. And one of those Mujahideen was a guy named Osama bin Laden who hated Saddam Hussein, whose family was friends with our friends in Saudi Arabia. And the enemy of our enemy was who now? The enemy of our enemy is whose friend? I think that now I am an enemy to the enemy of our enemy is our friend theory. With friends like Baby Doc, Samosa, and Pinochet, I think it's time we just focus on making friends with people who don't want to kill their own people, or us, or the spiders, or the skunks. I choose peace.
please. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, yeah, and they're they're there again. They're back. Um, you know, have to repoint those bricks because that smell just comes right through. Um, <clears throat> and two more. Uh, this, I wrote this one uh, late last year, and then I just heard that they're uh, getting ready to uh, put a guy in jail for 20 years for leaving water and food for the people trying to make it across the desert. And um, then I wrote about this story. It's just called Jugs of Water. Jugs of water left in the desert, life-saving water in the desert, emptied by Migra with a license to kill. Killing desperate people in the boiling sun, jugs of water, drops of compassion. Tossed aside, murder in my name, murder in your name. More blood on our hands. Heck of a job, Donnie. Fewer brown people in your hair, so to speak. Dead people don't become citizens. Dead people don't vote, usually. Latinos dead from thirst, Latinos dead from drowning in the desert in Puerto Rico. Sensing a theme here, Don Bo. Maybe a movie. Zombie Mexicans and Puerto Ricans descending on DC, looking to eat brains but going hungry again. <laughs> Cabrones killing us again. Jugs of water, hurricanes, the torture of no water, the torture of too much water, drops of blood, drops of blood, jugs of water, drops of blood. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more, and then we'll um, hopefully sell and sign some books right over here. Uh, this is one of my Puerto Rico poems. I'm half Puerto Rican, and uh, uh, this one was published in the Quelly Journal that's uh, out of New York. And it's called The Big Houses Burn. And this is after uh, the tragedy of Hurricane Maria. The big house is burned. Maria ripped the leaves from the trees, the veil from the face of the predator's delight. The lights go out. The dialysis machines, the ventilators, the fans in the nursing homes stop. The lights go out in Puerto Rico. Bodies roll into the sea. Smoke rises from crematoriums. The lights go out in Borinquen. The lights in the eyes of the predators sparkle as they drool and scream. The lights go out on the island of my heart. The cost-benefit analysis of dead and fleeing Boricuas inspires toasts in fluorescent boardrooms. The lights go out. The calculators hum. The flash of machetes in the forest. The lights go out. The rage comes on, the lights go out, the big houses burn. Thank you. Okay, and this last one is the title poem of my uh, chapbook from last year. And this is based on um, the terrible uh, flooding that occurred in um, in Louisiana about two or three years ago, um, and I'll just tell the story this way. This is and this was um, in Baton Rouge. Uh, that wasn't uh, the other one. This is called "The Dead Go Swimming." The endless water falls on the red cane left lying on the sidewalk where the old man fell for the very last time. 
The endless water came in sheets, in walls, pushing the trees, the cars, everything was moving this time. The constant water filled the streets, the ground, the schools, the houses. Everything was knocked down and rising with the waves. The constant water took no breaks, spared no buildings, no animals, no people breathing or people not breathing. The pounding rain beat the ground with clear fists until everything below was above and the dead were rising. The pounding rain produced a coffin parade, a bobbing line of ornate boxes, some with handles, others with symbols. The constant beating on the chest of the earth brought out the dead who were trying to escape the inevitable final cough, the death rattle, the clicking sounds the final breaths before the heart of fire goes out. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you and thanks to the wonderful poets laureates, my friends who came here and to you uh, good audience folks. Um, so, if you're of a mind, please uh, pick up a copy of Undocumented, and one or all of us will sign it. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>